going to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Pastor Jan Eric Neyman from Tanzania. Um, Pastor Jan Eric is a Swedish born, but he lived most of his life in Tanzania, where he's in full time missions with his entire family. His ministry in Tanzania is linked to a Swedish agency uh, called IBRA. Apart from vast experience in first hand missions, he also regularly speaks on urban missions. He, he was also involved in a documentary that was recently produced on how ordinary people can be activated to be, uh, become disciples, who makes disciples and plant churches. Just apart from the script, one thing that you must know about Pastor Jan, uh, he's been in the ministry now for 50 years. And uh, 47 years of that, 50, he was working with his dad for about three years, then for 47 years, he's been doing missions. It's an honor to have you, man of God. Can you just clap hands for him as he's coming to, to speak to us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. I didn't expect anything like this. As a child of Africa, I'm more used to sit under a tree and uh, chat with people than standing in a big auditorium and um, feel much more at home with the tribal people somewhere and not so much at home with so many dignified people as you are here. But it's really a privilege and a joy. As you heard, we live in Tanzania. I have worked all across Africa, um, inspiring for church planting and disciple making, using media as a tool. Um, I'm here because uh, last year, um, Dr. Arto invited me to a missions conference in Kenya to speak on the topic of urban missions and the use of social media. Pastor uh, Ron was there and heard it and wanted me to come and share it with you here, which is a great privilege. So, um, I don't know if you get it on the screen, the PowerPoint, I have a PowerPoint with many slides, um, but don't worry, if we, we'll walk through them quickly. Yeah, urban mission and the use of social media. Why do we need urban mission? Um, that's the next slide. So just follow my hint on my, my words, you that are pushing forward the slides. Why urban missions? And why focus on young people? Those are the two big questions uh, that we can uh, ask ourselves today. Um, why urban mission? for the cities. Well, if you look at the main cities of the world, the largest cities of the world today, Tokyo is the largest with 37 million. And we have a lot of cities in Asia and South America that are the largest cities today. But in 2050, already we will begin to see um, African cities coming up among the 10 largest cities in the world. And if you go to 2075, I'm happy that I will not be alive then because I think the traffic is already terrible in Kinshasa and Lagos. Uh, but by then, they estimate that Kinshasa will have 58 million citizens and uh, Lagos 57. And Dar es Salaam, my own capital, 37 million people. Now with 6 million is already... Um, terrible to try to get through that city. So cities are growing exceptionally quickly and Africa is a young continent. I don't know if you can see the figures there, but if you look at Niger, uh, center of West Africa, you can see that the median age in Niger is 15.1 years. That means that half of the population is under the age of 15. Very young population. And the same goes for most of the countries in Africa. Here in South Africa, the median age is quite high if you compare to the rest of the continent. 
you're an old nation compared to the rest of us in Africa. So, and why social media? Next slide. Why should we use social media? Well, you can see that the slides we're getting here are a little bit off with my sink, but to why we need to, to reach the young generation is that every generation is of course lost without Christ. And we have heard about missions here today and about passions for missions. If we don't cry, if our hearts are not broken for the next generation and for the lost, then Christ's heart will be broken for us because he, his heart is broken for the lost. And he wants and he expects us to have a broken heart for the lost. And every new generation is lost until they find Christ. I have the privilege of following in, my, in the previous generation's footsteps. My grandfather's brother was a missionary to China in the 1930s. My parents took me to Africa when they were young. They were only 28 years old and I was just a small kid when we came to Tanzania. And he has been influenced with his uh, uncle to become a missionary. My dad took me out in the wilderness when he went to witness, to preach. I followed him from the young age of eight to nine years when we were a bicycle through the jungle to meet people and sometimes being scared meeting all the wild animals and the snakes. There were plenty of snakes in that area. And I remember one day when, when my father was closing his uh, short sermon in prayer, sitting on a, on a small uh, chair under a tree and a green snake came down just above his head and uh, yeah, that was scary, but he's still alive, 90 years old now. Um, I got something in my heart that started to cry out for the loss from a young age, and that is following me until today. Today, our son is in ministry, and we are just praying that his children will follow soon. I think it's something beautiful when it goes generation to generation, even if we all need to have our own decision. Okay, so why social media? Why should we need to use social media for the young generation in the urban setting? Well, if you know anything about social media, you'll know that almost 60% um, of the world's population uses social media today. We can move forward. Um, a few slides, I believe. Um, and on average, now I can see you have the wrong PowerPoint, my friends, um, because that, now I, I saw if the people up there, there, because on the stick I gave, there were two PowerPoints. That is for another presentation. Um, that is why it's off sync a little bit. So look for the other one, I'm sorry. Uh, urban missions and the use of social media as the heading of that presentation. Now, why social media? Everyone at average that is on social media spends two hours, 31 minutes on social media. That's where people are gathering today. I think we know it. We are there ourselves. Facebook has about three billion monthly users. Three billion people, almost half of the, pop the world's population, have used Facebook this past month. YouTube, two and a half billion people in a month, and WhatsApp, two billion. And did you know that 3.7 million new videos are uploaded to YouTube every day? Who is going to watch it? And why? Um, there are more than 800 million videos on YouTube today. If you would sit down and watch all these YouTube videos, and no one would add any more YouTube videos,
from today, you will have to spend 17,810 years to watch all the YouTube videos that are there. So you just can imagine how much material is out there. And that is where opinions and decisions are formed today on the social media. Um, and the fact is that opinions today are formed by, um, sorry, opinion, decisions are formed by opinions more than facts today. People look at what do other people think, what are other people saying, and we have many opinion makers that are not officially decision makers, but they're actually pushing us to make decisions. You have all these influences um, that are on, on the social media. You have people like Cristiano Ronaldo, football player. He has 624 million followers on Instagram. That's, he has the most following on Instagram of all, a football player. And he shapes opinion of football fans all around the world. What he thinks is good, well, his followers think that it's good. And their followers. And the second, the second most followers is Lionel Messi, another football player. And then on third place comes Selena Gomez with 430 million followers. Do you see what I'm saying? These people shape and influence the minds of our societies today, those people that we call influencers. And where are they? They are on social media. Um, we are not aware, or we don't think about it, that the thinkers the philosophers and the religious leaders are the ones that are shaping the opinions of people and it is brought to the wider knowledge through what we call the balladeers, the people of arts, the musicians, the filmmakers. Now we have the, have the right one. If you go f uh, quick forward to where you see, this we have already talked about, yeah, a few, few more slides, one more, I think, two more. There we are, thank you. Our opinions are shaped by philosophers and by thinkers and by religious people. And it's taken to the wider audience by the arts, music, films, and whatnot. Just think of how words have changed value over the last 20 years. Um, and it's through the arts. I will not take time to give you examples, but there are many examples how even words that we couldn't even mention in our churches are now part of our church vocabulary and culture. It has found its way to us because what happens after the people of art have distributed the message and shaped the opinion, the lawmakers and the business people, they will follow the opinion of the masses and they will try to make laws and do business that make the masses happy. And it filters down to the ordinary people. If you look to the right of that slide, you see the core word in this process starts with cult, meaning that you um, actually um, sort of think that something is of great value. And cult shapes culture, and culture cultivates who we are. So we, as God's people, need to be aware of this and influence at the root in order to make a difference in the daily lives of people. What we are teaching from the Word of God, what we are preaching 
need to be out there in the arts, in the media, to influence everything that happens in our society. But today, our society is full of fake news. The next slide, please. A lot of, peop of things that is just made up. Um, because today there is no such thing as an absolute truth. It is my truth, and it's your truth, and we respect each other's truths. And that's if I come up with something false, it's okay, because that's how the world uh, functions today. So a few years back, the, the new word on the list of words was the next slide, post-truth. We are living in the area of post-truth. There is no such thing, they say, as an absolute truth. We as God's people know there is an absolute truth. And that is the truth that has to be proclaimed. This is more complicated today even by the rays of uh, artificial intelligence, AI. The next slide. Um, and people do not see the difference between what is real and what is not real at times. Just a short while ago, there was a picture circulating in a lot of WhatsApp groups in Tanzania um, that was a picture of the Pope um, standing at an altar being married to a woman. Of course, it was just created by AI, but it really looked like the Pope. And many people said that now is the end of the Catholic Church because the Pope has got married. But of course, it was just someone playing around with in artificial intelligence. It can be a help, but we need to be aware. All of these are things that we need to be aware of as God's people when we try to build trust. The next slide. Trust is the key word for what we are preaching and what we are reaching out with. To, and no one will listen to our message if we cannot build trust. So, um, next slide. Do you remember what we said earlier, that almost 60% of the world's population uses social media, and they use it for hours and hours a day. So where do we need to be? We need to be people and meet them where they are. Next slide. We need to meet them where they are, and they are there out on the social media. And what are we going to do there? Next slide. Making disciples. And why are we going to make disciples? Well, God planned for a big family from the beginning. And uh, we know it, so I will not go into depth in that, that God is love and he created mankind in his image in order to multiply because he wanted a big family that he could love. And God's family uh, will finally gather at home in heaven one day if and when they accept Christ as the Savior and can become part of fa God's family again. Um, now, and we do, this, we make disciples because Jesus commanded us to make disciples. disciples. We know it very well from Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, when he gave us the Great Commission. And as we have heard here earlier today, that is not for a few, it's for every one of us that call ourselves disciples of Jesus to multiply ourselves into a new generation of believers and a new generation of disciples. So, if we agree so far that we need to reach the urban cities because that's where more, more and more people meet and congregate, that we need to reach out to the young generation and we need to make disciples. Now comes then the question, how do we make disciples in these settings? Let me take you on a journey on how we can make disciples. Um, I'm not a big expert, but I'm speaking from, as we heard, almost 50 years of experience in trying to make disciples using media here in Africa. 
And the very first thing that we need to do to make disciples is to know our audience. Who are we speaking to? Next slide. Uh, who are we speaking to? Who, who are we trying to reach? We need to know age, education, religion, their interests and their needs. We need to know where they are meeting. We need to know to go where they are. You remember when Jesus called us, he said, go and make disciples. And that's the key word. Too often we sit and we wait that people find us where we often are hiding behind some walls. But Jesus told us to go, even to the places where it's uncomfortable. He told us to go to the places that are different from our background and circumstances. Um, he asked us to find them where they are. And today we find many of the young people on the social media and in the big cities. Paul, in the Bible, he knew his audience. You can read in Acts 17, verse 16 to 23, how Paul was waiting on his uh, friends in Athens. As he was waiting there, he was walking around in the city, and he was looking and watching. He was sitting down, he was listening to people, talking to people, and when he got a chance at the Areopagus, he could then tell them that I have seen that your religious people you're worshiping a God that you do not know. I have come here to tell you about that God. He could connect with the people because he knew who they were. And that's what I would like to give you as a tip. How to know your audience. You do as Paul. The next uh, slide, please. What did Paul do? He looked. He listened. And he learned his lesson. And then he linked what he learned to the message he wanted to get across. So it became natural for them. They, and they, they, it became relevant to listen to what he had to say. And he loved them. He, taught, he spoke in love. We can never do missions. We can never reach out to a people without love. That is the absolute foundation. We need Christ's love for people. But this is very important if you want to like to make disciples among people that are slightly different from, from ourselves. If it's an Irish people group, if it's a younger generation than ourselves, look, listen, learn, link, and love. Then you can begin to communicate. And we have to remember at today's generation, they are thinking differently because they've been shaped by social media. There is a paradigm shift, um, next slide, uh, in, in the way we need to communicate. We used to deliver our message. In churches, we have been preaching. On media, we have been preaching. On radio and TV, we have been broadcasting out to the masses the message. But today, people want to do, explore, they want to discover, because that's what they do on social media. They explore and discover new topics and, and find out for themselves. So if you want to communicate with a young generation today, and basically any generation that has got used to social media, we need to welcome exploration and discovery together, rather than just deliver a message like I'm doing right now. That's why I said I feel more comfortable under the tree when we can discover together with a few. Now, um, we have moving from the presenter's perspective, from my perspective, to the consumer's need. That is what really drives people. That is what communicates. If we communicate according to someone's needs, um, that's where we really um, touch people's hearts. And the next slide, we are going from content controlled by the media developer to content controlled by the user's choice. There's so much choice today. We cannot control. Years back, it was easy. There were a few TV channels, a few ch radio channels to choose from, and people would take in any message that came their way. But today is not the case. People are looking for what they like. 
people are looking for what is relevant to them in the situation they are in right now. So that means uh, that the social media today is seeker-centric. Um, it's not around the sender, it's not around the presenter, it's circles around the seeker. What is his need? What is, his, is relevant for him? What is he looking for? What do he want to learn? It is not program-centric. Social media is interactive. Uh, it's a uh, communication, two-way communication. But the big challenge with uh, online media is the information noise. It's really noisy out there. Um, 1.13 billion websites to browse. Uh, no one can manage that. 252,000 new websites are created every day. So that figure is old, even though I picked it uh, some time ago. Um, 300 plus million photos uploaded every day. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of comments and, and hundreds of thousands of status updates. Um, next slide. 30,000 internet radio stations. It was years back when we started the media ministry in Tanzania, there were five radio stations broadcasting in the Swahili language to, in total, and one Christian station. Now there are 30,000 radio stations on the internet. Anyone can listen to any time. 5,000 TV channels are live from 180 countries just on one website. And on top of that, many, many more. And we already looked at how many million YouTubes uploaded every day and 4.4 million blog posts published daily. So it's noisy out there. Why would someone listen to you? That is the big question. How can you penetrate that noise? So that's the next question we're going to look it into uh, briefly. Remember that social media is not preaching. It doesn't. Some people, they love to put uh, their sermons on social media, either in writing or recorded, but no one really has the patience to listen to a, a sermon on social media. Not to even lecturing, even if it's a topic that people want to listen to. It cannot be too long, uh, because social media is about storytelling. That's what works on social media. And here we have a great opportunity as God's people to welcome people to interact with our story. Welcome people to interact with your story. Next slide. Tell what's unique, what's ex exciting, what is relevant, what is worth discussing. We all have a story and tell your story within his story, within God's story. Um, give a glimpse how God fits into your story. That is now what begins to be interesting for people out there, to get to understand that this is an ordinary person. This is someone that I have maybe got to know over social media, and I'm following over social media, and he has something to tell me about God. God is in his life somehow. That's where we really have something, um, a way to make an impact. And it makes sense because from my early days in radio, we learned that testimonies is the most powerful uh, format to reach out to people. Monitor the social media conversations. Listen to and look for what people are saying about the topic you want to get across. Um, how is it going? What is, what is on people's uh, walls today? social media walls, what are, what, is the, what are the discussions? Do we have something to say from the God's word to them? And pay attention to their needs, the challenges, and their preferences. Um, because the highway into someone's heart is through his felt needs. What he feels, what the person feels that is his need, he will pay attention to that. He will listen to that. If someone is facing a challenge and you offer a solution or a reflection about that, 
he'll be all ears. That is how we can penetrate the noise somehow. And learn from the culture, even when it's uncomfortable. For us as God's people, there's so much out there that feels very uncomfortable, so much that we are coming across on social media that we do not agree to. My son is much better because he's much younger, but he's much better than me to follow even Muslim teachers. And he follows the atheists and he listens to what are they talking about? What is going on? And he put that next to the word of God and thinks that how can we address this? The, 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 the things that is going on in their minds, in their discussions. It's very uncomfortable to take part of these discussions at times. And uh, really, not only un uncomfortable, even painful, but when we use that opportunity, we can talk directly into people's lives with the word of God. So when we have got to know our audience, we we'll begin to create content. So the way we create, we should most of all share useful, relevant, and engaging content that resonate with your audience that we have just got to know. Should be of some use. Should be uh, someone listening, li reading your short post, uh, looking at your picture with a short text or a 30 second video, should be useful to them, should be relevant, should touch something that they could begin to think about, should be engaging. Uh, and we should use images and videos to capture attention and ca capture and convey the message. Uh, today, people are more used to images and videos than anything else. That is the next slide. Um, we are so used in church that we use a lot of words. And we use the print media, and we have used it wisely for many, many years. But today's communication is more through images and videos. And that takes me to the fact that we learned all, uh, earlier that the arts is a strong communicator of values. Um, so think about all kinds of arts, uh, poetry, images, short films, videos, music, that communicate the message we have in a way that touches people's needs and uh, is relevant to, to them. When we create a message, it needs to be short, it needs to be personal, it needs to be positive. I call it the big yes. The church is known to be no sayers. We say no to a lot of things. Uh, and that's how people outside of the church feel that that's how the church is. They say no to everything that is fun. Now, for every no, there is an opposite yes. So instead of saying no to abortion, why don't say yes to the family? We promote the importance and the lovely thing of having a family and the beauty of having babies in our home. And we don't need only to press that thing that, yes, we don't like that. We don't like abortion. We're against it, absolutely. But present the positive side, which is the opposite. If we have that perspective, we will gain so much more followers. Encourage and encourage especially dialogue and comments. Because we want to use social media to create dialogue. Your post should educate, encourage, and entertain. This is what the experts in the field say. Any post that doesn't encourage or educate or entertain will be scrolled through very quickly. Um, you need to give people a reason to come back for more on your, your, your page. And when you receive an engagement reply promptly to comments, questions, messages, and be timely and respectful when you do so. Um, don't wait several days. Social media is quick and immediate. And show appreciation for positive feedback and address negative comments with empathy 
and professionalism. Encourage conversations, invite feedback, share your perspective, because as I said, we need to encourage dialogue, um, because that's how we function as humans. That's how God interacts with us. He wants dialogue. Um, and that's the way people interact today in dialogue. And if they have learned something, ask them, what will you do with what you have learned? And how will you implement it? That's the next slide. That um, will help people um, to put into practice and the following question, who will you tell what you have learned? Become practical. We want people to change. We, 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 as a church, we want to bring change in society, isn't it? So whatever we talk about, ask what will you do with what you have learned? And who will you share it with? And open the door to one-on-one -on -one conversations to become personal, because that is really where change, real, true change will happen. And we, if we deal with a biblical topic, encourage the formation of discovery Bible study groups that discover the Bible together online or offline. I just got a message this morning from our new team on Zanzibar, a very, very Muslim context, where we just recently have started not to use social media as such, but to buy one a half an hour program every week on a popular FM station with programs that we just talk about the issues and the problems the Muslim population are facing in Zanzibar, which are mainly family issues, a lot of family problems that they're facing. Um, and then we invite them to discover who God truly is. And in the last three months only, 10 Bible discovery groups have started with Muslims. None of them have yet accepted Christ, but they are on a journey. They are open to begin to discover because they found someone that showed love, someone that understood them, someone that seems to be have something in, of importance to tell them. To overcome so, some of the noise, we can use hashtags to increase visibility and in, to engage with influencers. I say my time is running out, so I need to run as well. Um, those that are already big names, um, if you find someone who has the similar mission to yours, um, try to find how you can work with them, collaborate with them in campaigns. Of course, you need to be very cautious and do not uh, just interact with anyone uh, that is, has a totally different value system than yours. But you can find people that have a lot of followers. And as a church, if we have social media pages, why don't encourage our members? There are many of our members, I'm sure, that have a lot more following than our church page. So make sure that we are collaborating uh, in that. Um, and share also the other people's content while, they are, while acknowledging their contribution to your cause. And then follow through. There are a lot of tools with social media that where you can analyze how you're doing, how many likes you get, how many share, comments, mentions, and so forth, and use that to adjust your strategy to improve engagement with people over time. Remember, social media is a two-way conversation. So listen, engage, and build relationships. And most of all, have a plan. Think through what you want to do over time. Publish regularly, respond promptly, and use available material when you don't have time to produce your own. And remember that social media happens in bubbles. Uh, traditionally, we try to pull people into our bubbles, into our churches and so on, but the Bible tells us to go out from your bubble and to enter their bubble. So be willing also on social media to interact respectfully with people in their group, ask questions, 
questions and nudge them uh, to conversation to where you want them to be. I mentioned my son, he has very interesting discussions in a forum for, uh, for atheists. And he has come into very deep conversations with some very strong atheists that are beginning to change their minds. Uh, because he has respectfully uh, communicated with them in their bubble. Um, so uh, that might be one way of going, of reaching out. And don't see yourself as a producer. We can all produce content today. So teach and mentor young people to use these tools because they're much better than we are. Um, and think strategic, think disciple, the disciple journey. Um, I used to call it the disciple journey. You can take the next slide even. Um, because we are bringing people on a journey when we are making them disciple, when we are helping them to find Christ. And that always starts with prayers, as we have heard this morning. We can do nothing in missions without prayer. It ha everything has to be saturated in prayer just as we have heard. So that's where it starts, and it will continue throughout, but uh, you cannot start without prayer. And then engage with the target audience. Produce material that, to begin to, that will help you to begin a conversation. And, and in that conversation, identify a key person, someone who is interest, someone who has a spiritual interest, he wants to know more about spirituality, he is generous, meaning that he is willing to share what he learns, and uh, he has a network, he is opening the door to uh, family and friends and whatsoever, and invite them to begin to discover the Bible, in discovery Bible study. You know, instead of preaching, invite people to discover the Word of God, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is the best preacher, much better than us. Uh, so if we sit down with people, or even if we're on a distance, just leading them to a passage of the Bible that they themselves can discover together, <clears throat> you'll see that the Word of God will speak to them. Uh, last week, I was in a conference with Somali believers where we're using social media in that very difficult context to reach out. And I tell you, there is a huge harvest among the very uh, resistant Muslims of the Somali people today because of social media. And there are many groups that are formed in remote places where no believer have gone physically, but they have accepted Christ and they are mentored over social media until someone can go and visit them. Sometimes it's um, dangerous to visit them. I have many of my friends who have been jailed and who have been even chased with knives and, and uh, been in very dangerous situations when they have tried to follow up these people that they have got in contact with through social media. And from Discovery Bible Study, when people begin to accept Christ, uh, churches might develop. And we need to develop leaders uh, that take care of that church, mentored under previous leaders. This is what we call the disciple journey. Whatever we do in, in, with our teams and the people we are working with, it, we always think the end result is people that follow Jesus, that are disciples of Jesus, that multiply, that give birth to new disciples, and we remind ourselves these should form new churches where there is no church, churches that multiply into the next village and to the next place. Um, from the first message we post, we dream about churches being planted among a people group. So if we think about young people in urban settings, begin to dream about churches filled with young people vibrant disciple makers in your cities. And remember that everything that happens online must at some point lead to offline because that's where the gospel lives. Real people, real relationships, real discovery Bible study groups and churches. Virtual people. 
I don't know if they're going to have them. Virtual relationships, they are not as much worth as real relationships. And real churches and groups are really needed because that's how God intended it. So keep your focus right. Don't follow other people's footstep. Create the footstep yourself. Pave the way for uh, a new uh, way of thinking and doing missions. Also in the urban context, reaching out to the new generation. Um, it is scary at times. We don't, but we don't have to know how things will be going. We just have to have a team that continually learns. I'm not a young man any longer, but I'm telling you, I'm learning more now than I, when I was young, because I have to. I have to learn constantly. And I'm glad that I have people around me, I have young people around me that pushes me up the wall and says that we cannot do as you did when you were young, because it's another world. And they challenge me with questions and whatnot. And even Michelangelo said, never stop learning. So be bold and go on. And just finally, if you push on a few slides that have already been true, I'm an inspiration. Yes, what we are doing now, um, planting churches among uh, Andrish people group, and especially along the east coast of Africa, what we call the Swahili coast, the Muslim people. We produced recently a documentary documenting what is happening when people begin to uh, make disciples that make disciples by discovering the word of God together. Originally, we planned to do, show the meaning of media in it as well, because much of it has started because of our media ministry, but we decided to take it out so that people don't think that you need media to do missions. You can do missions straight on. The important thing is that ordinary people, ordinary young and old people become missionaries begin to share with people around them. And it's possible for all of us to uh, start discovery Bible study groups and lead people into discovering the Word of God, even in difficult circumstances. Uh, the QR code uh, will take you directly to the uh, YouTube channel where you can find this uh, documentary. And we encourage people to watch it in groups. When you watch it in groups, um, you can discuss afterward what you have learned. Um, there is also a lot of training videos, not so many, but a few training videos on uh, uh, disciple-making movements, the disciple journey I was talked about on this QR code. And finally, if you want to, to uh, learn more of the strategy of making disciples online, there is a, a PDF document that uh, you can require from me. On the last slide, you have my email and WhatsApp if you would like to have that, if you want to use social media more effectively for any uh, purpose, if it's urban or any other purpose. Not so much the how, it's more why and the strategic thinking behind it. The, there are lots of YouTube videos that can teach you how to be effective in social media. We don't need to do that, but from a strategic missionary point of view, how should you think? That's what this document is about. Thank you very much, and God bless you.